So this uh, surrealist exhibition starts with this room of photographies of Paris. Uh, they have a very good choice of photographies from very important people like Man Ray, Germain Krull. I think we have, even have photos of Brassai. And I thought it was a very good idea to start with this because Paris is really the city where it all happened. Uh, even though a lot of the members of the Surrealist group were initially from the Dada movement, which started in Switzerland, many of them actually had been in Paris when the whole Surrealist movement begins. So uh, Surrealism is really the brainchild of, of one person at first, which is André Breton, who was a medical student who was initiated to the theories of Sigmund Freud very early on and started the exploration of uh, something they felt was very important, which was to create new myth, a new mythology, which is basically the, the title of this exhibition, which very rightfully insists on the issue of myth. It was very important because uh, a lot of mostly young men who created surrealism, uh, had experienced the First World War. We're very aware of uh, the problems of what was presented as Western civilization, which insisted so much on rationality that in the mind of both the Dada artist and the surrealist, this focus on reason led to the war itself, led to the mechanization of the war, this obsession with the machine, which led to you know, very efficient mechanical killing of millions of people. So they felt that there was something very wrong with that civilization of reason and wanted to explore this new frontier that was the unconscious uh, revealed by the theories of Sigmund Freud. So the fact that a lot of data artists had moved to Paris by the 1920s also it allowed uh, the Surrealist movement to, to begin with a, a larger, rather large group of people uh, who came out of Dada and its questioning of Western civilization also, of Western art. So the, 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 the ground was very fertile to explore uh, these new ideas. So André Breton, with his exploration of Sigmund Freud's idea of the unconscious, believed that art could be the ground where you could explore these uncharted territories that were the unconscious. And this was true for both the literary arts and the visual arts. Uh, André Breton wrote several uh, theoretical texts on surrealism and how we can achieve the exploration of the unconscious. Uh, and again, as I said, had uh, already a large group of people interested in these ideas. So, um, as a result, Paris was really the center, the place where all this happened. And these photos are wonderful because they really reveal the face of Paris at the time the Surrealist movement was at its height, really. So we have photos from the 1930s, mostly. As you can see, Paris is a, an almost an empty city. Very few people in the streets, very few cars. You know, cars were luxury items still by then. And, and Paris was the perfect place uh, to do that kind of artistic exploration. This being said, we should never forget that surrealism is from the start a very international movement. You know, for instance, these photos are by Man Ray, who is an, an American artist. Uh, people like Brassai were coming from uh, Central Europe. Uh, German Krull was, uh, I think, I'm not sure, but had uh, uh, German origins. So, uh, of course, you had Dali, you had Miro, who are both Spanish. So it's a very international movement. Uh, the other thing I need to emphasize, I'll re you know, remind you of this with the other artworks, is that um, surrealism became so important in the history of art of the 20th century that it sometimes uh, overwhelmed everything that was happening at the same time. So, for instance, we will see here in this exhibition's work by Picasso. And, you know, it's really stretching the truth to say that Picasso was a surrealist. He was briefly a member of the movement, but Picasso is much more than that. Um, this exhibition also emphasizes the work of a very important intellectual called Georges Bataille, who published several publications 
that were really a critique of surrealism. Uh, this exhibition chooses to represent Bataille as part of surrealism. I don't think it's totally accurate, um, but of course they were closely connected because again, surrealism was so overwhelming. But you had other movements like you know, a publication called the, the Great Game, Le Grand Jeu, by poets like René Domal and Roger Gilbert Lecomte who are almost forgotten today because of the overwhelming presence of surrealism. And all this was taking place in this amazing city of the 1920s and 30s that was Paris. So, uh, the problem with the unconscious is that it is not accessible. Uh, even Freud makes it clear that the unconscious is not something you have access to, of course. What you have access to is the conscious. Uh, so from the start, someone like André Breton, who claimed that the only interesting kind of art was the art rooted in the activities of the unconscious, he had a problem, and he had to define techniques that would allow surrealist artists to somehow tap into the unconscious. And you can only do that indirectly. So uh, Breton believed very much like Sigmund Freud. You know, Sigmund Freud talks about, for instance, uh, slips of the tongue, where you, you say something accidentally, and you believe that's not what you meant, but Freud would tell you, no, you know, that's what the unconscious meant. Um, slips of the tongue are revealing of unconscious activities. And Breton immediately realized that one of the ways to reveal the unconscious is to rely on accidents and also um, relinquishing control, not letting the artist decide everything. And one of the ways to do this is to basically share the activity. So he came up with an idea that was later on called exquisite corpse, cadavre exquis in French, because the first sentence obtained like this started with the two words, cadavre, exquis. And it meant having someone start a sentence, then hide part of the sentence to reveal only the last word, and give that piece of paper to someone else who would continue the sentence, continue hiding the sentence, which means that the person writing would only see the last word of the sentence written by the first person, and so on. So in the end, you would obtain a completely nonsensical work made by a group of people. And Breton also very quickly realized that you could do this with the visual arts too. So this is an example. And as you can see, this work was made by, by three people. So André Breton, the creator of surrealism, Paul Éluard, a very important poet of the group, which Interestingly, he was also the first husband of Gala, who left him to marry Salvador Dali later. So this is the you know, sex stories about the surrealist group. And uh, Nuchelua, who was the second wife of the poet. So you have three persons doing that work. And it, it starts like this. So let's assume that Breton started. So Breton made the beginning of that figure the head, and would hide part of it to just reveal the bottom part of his part. Then he gives the piece of paper to Eluard, who continues. He hides part of it, gives it to the third person, who completes the drawing. So doing this, you get a completely accidental shape that was done by a group of people. So that was the idea of relinquishing control of the artist using this very, very simple method. Now, I can tell you, this is something I don't know now, but when I was a child, when I was in school, me and my friends, especially in mathematics class, we did hundreds of these things. We did hundreds of cadavre key. You know, the whole class would participate in secret. The teachers were not <laughs> supposed to know. So these are absolutely wonderful group activities. Um, it was never really used to make finished artworks. Interestingly, the, the few cadavrex key that remains were either transformed into finished artworks by one of the artists, 
and never really uh, shown. They were shown in some exhibitions, but were never often uh, collected. Uh, I guess it has something to do with the, the identity of the artist in, you know, in early 20th century uh, Europe, where only the work of one person mattered. So this kind of work was very successful as a method, was never really productive in terms of what you can show in an exhibition, for instance. So that's the first method devised by André Breton as a technique to access the unconscious indirectly. The other method devised by André Breton and his friends was automatism. Um, it started as a method of writing. So one of the first texts obtained by the method of automatism was written by André Breton and his friend Philippe Soupeau, another poet of the Surrealist group. And the idea was to put into writing anything that goes through your head without trying to control that too much. And um, they sort of put into this a bit of the cadavre ski method, because they were two writing a single text. Uh, the fact is that they did not just write down whatever they thought and just let it go. Eventually, they did a lot of editing, so it's, it's more of a readable text than you would expect. Uh, the other fact is that that kind of nonsense writing was already a method of the Dada artist, especially the poet Tristan Tsara had done thousands of pages writing a bit like this. So it was not too much of an effort to have people already practicing that kind of method. But Breton saw this as an entry point into the unconscious. Needless to say, automatism lends itself even better to the visual arts. We've all done this. You know, maybe not now, because uh, you know, smartphones are don't, not really conducive of this. But uh, many years ago, when you, you still had landlines, <laughs> you were on the phone. And if you had a piece of paper and a pen, you could start doodling things without really thinking about what you're doodling. That's the idea. All right? That's what you apply to automatism in obtaining visual forms. One of the first to do this, in fact, one of the first painter who associated himself with the surrealism is André Masson. All right? So th th that's not a bad example of automatic drawing. So this is made with a pen and ink on a piece of paper, just letting your hand go. And eventually, you can look at what you do you, you, you've done and try to identify forms and emphasize those forms. So eventually, it kind of looks like a figurative painting. You see, you know, a figure lying down, another with its hands in the air. But this was originally obtained by marks of the pen made without too much control. So this is a very productive way of making drawings. And Masson is one of the first to apply that method and used it and expanded it in many other artworks. And we will see another of his paintings that were, in fact, not made with the method of automatism and are more of a, a depiction of some of the theories of the surrealist and also psychoanalysis. So this painting by Masson uh, was probably not made, or at least not entirely made, with the method of automatism. Some aspects of the paintings were probably made according to this, but an automatic piece is necessarily a drawing. So whatever shape he obtained through automatism was translated into an oil painting like this. So this is a good starting point to talk about myth, all right, which is the central theme of this exhibition. Uh, the Surrealists were very eager to create a new mythology based on the theories of Freud and exploring through the arts, you know, this critique of rationality that I've already mentioned. So when they wanted to create a new mythology, it didn't mean that they wanted to create a new religion or anything like that, all right? Again, they were relying on the findings of Sigmund Freud and trying to define a new way to explore uh, these new frontiers of the unconscious. So in this case, and you know, this is something that Freud uses a lot, Greek myth in particular, 
In this case, we're dealing with the labyrinth that was you know, a, a Greek palace on an island uh, that was supposed to contain the Minotaur, this fantastic creature, the body of a man and the head of a bull, uh, which you know, the story is quite long. But both for Freud and for the surrealist, the labyrinth, the maze, was a perfect representation, symbolization of the human mind. This is a very complex place where you can lose yourself, and that can be very dangerous because there's a monster inhabiting it. So here, you know, in spite of the fact that some aspects of these paintings were probably made through automatism, a lot of it is purely narrative. For instance, the head of this monster, which is really a skull, right, is in fact reminiscent, of course, of a bull, right? So the whole character is reminiscent of the Minotaur, the half-man, half-bull creature that inhabits uh, the labyrinth. The labyrinth itself is represented inside this creature, you know, in its belly, basically, this place where you can lose yourself and are faced with your most feared experiences. And added to this, you have, you know, for instance, in what appears to be a leg, you have appearing uh, something like a column that is reminiscent of you know, classical architecture, Greek or Roman architecture. You have a lot of elements here that are telling the story of the unconscious mind as imagined by Sigmund Freud and as explored by you know, all the members of surrealism in a painting that mixes both aspects of automatism and the very straightforward telling of stories related to psychoanalysis, which is something that, for instance, Salvador Dali does a lot. You know, Dali doesn't do abstract painting. He makes figurative paintings telling stories, like this one, which is made by André Masson. So, as I've just said, Salvador Dali is purely a narrative painter. Every painting he does tells a story. And a lot of the elements he uses in his paintings uh, can often be found repeated in other paintings. Some of his films also. In fact, we have in this exhibition uh, the film The Golden Age, which was produced by both Luis Buñuel and Salvador Dali. And you have some visual elements in the film that are actually something you can find in some of his paintings, like the, the flaming giraffe, for instance. So, this painting also has elements that you find in his other film called uh, Un Chien Andalou, a, a dog from Andalusia, from the south of Spain, uh, where there's a famous scene where the main character pulls a grand piano with a dead donkey on it. And you can find here both the grand piano and the dead donkey. Uh, the grand piano tends to be uh, a symbol of Western culture, high culture, all right? Like classical music, which of course for a lot of the surrealists was dead culture. And the donkey, the dead donkey, is something he saw in his childhood, which was one of the, his first experience of death. He actually wrote a very important text called The Stinking Ass, where he tells of his uh, method to produce these paintings, which he calls uh, paranoiac, right? which is his own uh, understanding of what paranoia is. Um, the painting itself titled William Tell. The title itself is about a very famous uh, legend from Switzerland of uh, a resistance fighter during the early Renaissance uh, who, who was asked to prove his worth by using his crossbow to shoot an apple put on the head of his son, all right? So this idea of the father endangering the life of his son goes straight into the narratives of Sigmund Freud and the whole idea of the Oedipus complex where you know, every boy can only become a man once he has symbolically killed his father. Dali and his father had a very bad relationship. He actually made a lot of paintings about this. And this is all about his own relationship, fraught relationship with his own father. So you can see the father here, the taller figure, 
which of course is represented with his penis out, you know, it's big penis too, which puts the whole painting immediately into the context of you know, the issues of sexualities explored by Sigmund Freud. So Freud had a very vivid imagination of what might have happened a very long time ago uh, to the whole of humanity. And in a very famous book that he called, uh, titled Totem and Taboo, he tells of the, the primitive horde, the first group of human beings, led by a father who, had, who was the only one to have access to all the females of the group. So the only way for the young male to have access to the females was to kill the father. All right. And according to Freud, this really happened you know, centuries ago to the first group of human beings. No way to prove this, of course. So, uh, before he was murdered by his son, the father had to threaten all the young men of the group uh, to forbid them to have access to the females of the group. Remember, this is Sigmund Freud, okay? I'm not inventing <laughs> any of this. It's in Freud. And Dali was very aware of this. So the only way the father could threaten the young males and forbid them from having access to the females was to threaten them of castration, of cutting their sexual organs, which is why the father is represented with a very big pair of scissors. And the son, which is represented smaller, of course, points the father as being the source of all his problems and all the aggressivity that this whole idea uh, is creating. So that's where uh, Sigmund Freud bases his theories of the Oedipus complex, where the young man, to become a man, has to kill his father symbolically. Uh, in Totem and Taboo, the primitive horde, the whole thing ends up by the sons killing the father and eating his body. <laughs> Right. And again, this is in Freud. He cannot prove any of this, but he's so convinced of this that he based his entire theory of the Oedipus complex on these notions that Dali is also uh, here exploring. So you have a few other elements, like uh, the lion's head, which is also something you see in many of his other paintings, which also has something to do about uh, the aggressivity of the father. All right. So, uh, this painting, which relates to this old stories of William Tell, of the crossbow and the apple, of the danger sons are in the environment that, where, where the father is dominating. Uh, this is a pure translation in visual terms made by Salvador Dali of the theories of Sigmund Freud. All right. So from the start, Dali was particularly interested in these notions, and as you can see, all of it has to do with the myth that Freud explored. Uh, but it's also something that uh, the first group of surrealists, uh, led by André Breton, were quite uncomfortable with. You know, Breton was perfectly OK uh, exploring the unconscious and so on. But the moment it turned towards issues of sexuality and the body, he was far less comfortable. So at some point, Breton, who was like a a control freak. He wanted to control who was part of the Surrealist group, even tried to expel Dali. All right? And Dali, at some point, even got closer to the, 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 the other intellectual that was leading a group who was more interested in questions of the bodies, in questions related to ethnology, Georges Bataille, uh, who also published two magazines, one called Document, there's a copy over there, and another one called Acephal, which means without a head. The idea being that you know, the, the head is not there, uh, the center of reason is not there either. So you can explore more things if you're not hindered by reason. So Georges Bataille is the other very important uh, intellectual who was interested in these notions, all right? And as I said, this exhibition tends to represent Bataille as another trend within surrealism. I'm not sure it's quite the right way. I, you know, Bataille very often reacted against surrealism, but he felt himself to be an independent thinker, okay? 
This, however, makes sense because, as we will see later, both Breton and Bataille were, came together to produce this wonderful magazine that we have, the whole set here uh, called Minotaur. So we will see that later. So we've seen André Masson, who was French. We've seen Salvador Dali, who was, of course, a Spaniard. This is the most important and most visible German artist of the group, Max Ernst, uh, who actually lived many years in, in the US, in America. So Max Ernst is also someone who um, actually more than most of the others explored a, a variety of different techniques. Uh, for instance, he was very interested in uh, automatism. And his way of doing automatic drawings was to use a rubbing, frottage in French, which meant uh, usually he used old planks, pieces of wood. You just stick a piece of paper on this and then reproduce the texture of the piece of wood using a piece of charcoal or a pencil. And out of these traces, he would also develop a, a more figurative uh, uh, figures. Um, he was also, you know, I, I guess, being a German, having access to German language, he's probably the one who was the most open about uh, being influenced by a German uh, romantic art and German romantic poetry. And we're talking about poets like Novalis, who is someone who really you know, wrote at the end of the 18th century, early 19th century. Uh, and this really, really makes sense because after all, in the 19th century, the Romantic painters were the first to really explore ideas related to dreams. Uh, this is also true of some poets in France, like Gérard de Nerval, for instance, who is a 19th century poet uh, whom the Surrealists really admired. So uh, in, in this case, all right, and again, there's a whole variety of methods and outlooks in the works of Max Ernst. There's another painting here that really looks nothing like this one. This one is more figurative and really illustrates very well, again, the, the central theme of the exhibition, which is myth and mythology. Here, the one is, this one is called a, a chimera. So a chimera is a fantastic creature of Greek mythology, an animal made of uh, different parts. Uh, we still use the term, for instance, in, in chemistry, you know, <laughs> a chimera is, 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 a, is an entity made of various things. Um, the chimera is usually with the face of a woman, the breast of woman, the body of a lion, and the wings of, a, of an eagle, right? Which is basically all the elements you have here, all right? This is also important because uh, this is, it's not the face of a woman, it's more of the face of a bird which is what Max Ernst was really obsessed with. He even had what he presented sometimes as an alter ego, which is another self, uh, which was a fantastic bird that he called uh, Lop Lop <laughs> and appears in many of his other paintings. All right, so this painting is also you know, important for the theme of the exhibition as this exploration of myth, and in particular, Greek myth here. But we will soon see that the Surrealists were also very important in the intellectual history of Europe for being the first to really explore uh, non-European cultures, especially cultures from Africa and from America. So the exploration of myth, of the understanding of very different cultures in their context was also one of the very new things that the Surrealists and their somehow opponents, Georges Bataille, explored and were the first to explore. Breton had a vast collection of masks and ritual objects from Africa, from the Pacific Islands, and after he first went to Mexico, also from North and Central American cultures native cultures, of course. So I'm not sure uh, any of these were in the collections of uh, André Breton, but he had so many of them that uh, to raise a little money, I think that was in the 1950s, he actually uh, sold at an auction a large part of his collection 
of what was once called primitive art. Uh, this is not a term that is acceptable anymore. So this is really important because uh, the Surrealists were not the first to have taken an interest in African art and art from the, the, the Pacific Islands. Uh, Picasso famously was one of the first artists in France to take an interest in this. Uh, the, you know, the, the sort of uh, the, the beginning of modern art in, in Western Europe is the large painting of nudes he made called the Demoiselles d'Avignon. And uh, half the figures have faces inspired by African ask, mask, and the other figures are inspired by uh, Iberian, very ancient sculptures made in Spain. Uh, the other group of people who are very interested in that kind of art were the expressionist artists in Germany. Okay? Uh, the fact is, however, that neither Picasso nor the expressionists were particularly interested in the cultures that created these objects. They were only interested in the new forms of something that believed was, they, they believed was uh, rejecting, criticizing all the stereotypes of beauty that Western culture has, had created. So the first to really take an interest in the cultures that created these objects were the Surrealists, and in particular, uh, Georges Bataille. All right? So they were really starting a very different trend of understanding various cultures from outside Europe. And this really is important, because you, you, you may wonder why uh, these artists and intellectuals had access to objects like this. Well, you need to understand that a lot of these things were part of a series of institutions that were the result of colonialism, right? Countries like France and Germany and Belgium had large uh, colonies in Africa where African people were violently exploited, their cultures literally destroyed by Christian missionaries. And it was mostly the Christian missionaries who were sent to the villages uh, literally told to buy all that stuff to destroy them so that they could sell sculptures of the Virgin Mary, for instance, if they were French. So a lot of the, these objects ended up into these colonial museums in Western Europe that were also not terribly well informed on the cultures that created these objects. So the efforts to pursue this understanding of this remote cultures in completely different environment was a very, very new effort and something that you, know, you have to admire on behalf of these realist artists and their uh, associates in, in, in different movements, uh, in, especially in Paris at the time. So the first instance of a publication where this new curiosity for these remote cultures uh, came to fruition is in this uh, review, this magazine produced by Georges Bataille called Document, Documents. So this is the first issue. And when you look at the names of the participants, you have both poets, ethnologists, and art historian. You have, for instance, on the first line, you have Paul Pelliou, who is unfortunately quite famous in China uh, for being the one who stole thousands of Buddhist scrolls from the Tunhuang uh, caves, right? So he was a very important art historian of Asia. You have also people like uh, Karl Einstein, who was a literary critic and a philosopher, who was one of the first people to explore the works of Dali, for instance, and how the theories of Freud could make us understand the body better. And you have also here uh, Michel Léris, also a great poet of that period, uh, hard to classify, but who was also an ethnologist. And we will see uh, his participation in the other magazine published by both Breton and Bataille called uh, Minotaur. So inside, for instance, you would have images of Viking culture, Alaskan Native American culture, and on the same double page, on the other side, you have this wonderful covers of popular novel uh, that were published in the early 20th century of the adventures of the emperor of crime called Photomas. And uh, even the artists, the visual artists of surrealism were interested in that. And they were fascinated by how 
popular culture, uh, even early cinema, explored unintentionally, almost by accident, some of the ideas that the surrealist artists were exploring too. So Document is a very important publication to understand the turn towards you know, an interest for the world outside of Europe that these movements really created. So this photo by Erwin Blumenfeld is very interesting. And you know, I think it was a very good choice of the curators to show that photo and this painting we'll see in a minute. Uh, Blumenfeld was a, a Jewish photographer. Uh, in Europe at the time, it was, ex of course, extremely difficult to be Jewish. Uh, the Nazi were coming to power in Germany. He was from Germany. Um, he, he was very famous during the war in the allied part of the world uh, because he made a photo of Adolf Hitler as a skull with a swastika, which became an important uh, propaganda element for the allied forces against Germany. So this photo he took, he made, I should say, uh, when he was a refugee in Paris before he moved to America in 1941, where he became, interestingly enough, uh, a very famous freelance photographer working in the fashion industry, in magazines about fashion. So it, the, the title says it all, basically. All right? This is a reaction to the fascist rise that uh, Europe, unfortunately, suffered uh, during those times, the dictator. And it shows, of course, uh, the head of a calf sort of wearing the sort of you know, Roman toga that Roman politicians were, were wearing. So it shows sort of a, a critique, a mocking critique of fascist ideology that was dominating Europe when this photo was made in 1937. And uh, the photo itself was recycled, in a sense, in this painting by uh, Francis Picabia. So it's exactly a rendering of the photo by Blumenfeld. Okay, there's really no change to the calf head. Uh, the addition was of these hands that seem to worship the calf head. So there's quite a lot to unpackage here. Uh, first, the adoring hand uh, are not just, of course, a reference to the fact that this is a dictator and that both Mussolini and Stalin and Hitler were worshipped by a large number of people in Europe in those days. Uh, it's also a reference to uh, the Bible and to classical painting. There were many paintings made of the adoration of the golden calf, which is a, a story in the Bible. You know, the, the Jews uh, came out of the desert. Moses goes into the mountain to relax, I guess, and he gets a message from God who gives him the uh, table of the law, the Ten Commandments. During that time, the Jewish people had made a figure of God in the form of a golden calf. So Moses comes down the mountain with one of the commandments saying that you shall not worship an image of your God. So he gets very angry destroys the image of the golden calf. And ever since, the Jewish people have never made a representation of their god. All right? So this is the adoration of a false god, both in the Bible and in the mind of Francis Picabia. So Picabia is a very interesting artist, one of the first painters and people who would do uh, what we would call today installation art. He also made movies, movies without storyline, completely crazy images. Uh, he was also a very popular painter in the sense that you know, his work uh, attracted a lot of attention. He was one of these artists of the group, and also because he was coming out of the Dada movement, whose you know, sort of central idea was to criticize the ideology of Western culture. And he made a lot of images of, of machines as sort of a obscene, sexually oriented sort of contraption, which was his own way to criticize 
the rationality of Western culture that led to millions of dead during the First World War, for instance. So Picabia was, from the start, a very staunch critique of everything that went wrong with Western culture. And in this case, this is a, paint, a painting from uh, late 41, 42, so it's right during the war. And he was completely horrified at what was, was happening in Europe, especially in Nazi Germany, in fascist Italy, and so on. So that, that's his way of showing the horror of the dictatorships of Europe at that time. Uh, one thing which is probably uh, a pun that the artist thought of, you know, uh, Blumenfeld was living in France, so of course he spoke French, but it's not clear whether he spoke French well enough to do that kind of pun. Uh, in spite of his rather Spanish name, Picabia was French, and in French, uh, in tête de veau, a calf head is an insult you give to people who are completely stupid and very conventional, all right? So in the mind of Picabia, uh, maybe the most horrible part of fascism was that all these dictators were, in his mind, extremely conventional people. And, uh, and of course, you know, in 41, you had no real idea, if you were in France, for instance, of uh, the Shoah or the Holocaust, you know, the, killing of millions of Jews for absolutely no reason whatsoever. So they were not all really aware of the absolute horror that these dictatorships represented. In the mind of Picabia, the dictatorship meant accepting to being led by the most stupid and conventional of people, which is what dictators tend to be, of course. <laughs> 